see all of you. And as Karen said, I really do feel like this church is an extension of my family, and I am so glad to be a part of it. I know that this is definitely where God has placed me, and I hope you feel a sense of belonging here as well. If you're new here, we welcome you, and we'd love to talk to you afterwards. So today's message is not part of a series. We recently, as a preaching team, did a series on the book of Hebrews, and that series was so much fun. I enjoyed it. I hope you guys did. Now, in between series, we're doing some standalone messages. So mine that I'm doing today is not related to anything we said last week or anything we will do next week per se, but it's a message that I think is very important on a daily basis even. And the title is, Start With God. Already you might even begin to guess where this is going, but hear me out here. To start us off, I want you to ponder this question. Think about the last time you had really big news. I'm talking like big news, something that's too good not to share. You just can't keep it to yourself. Here's the question. Who is the first person you called? Usually we call someone on the phone. When it's news that big, you can't just text them, right? You want to hear their reaction in their voice. So you call them on the phone. Or maybe you went to them in person. So who was it? Who was the first person you called? Or who was the first person you went to when you had really big news? What about the last time you were really upset or really in need of advice? I'm talking desperately upset or desperately in need of advice. I ask the same question. Who is the first person you went to? The answer to that question says a lot about us and a lot about our relationships, which ones are most important to us. Who is the first person we go to? You know, what's interesting is I noticed this about myself. Maybe it's just because I have a big mouth. I'm a talker in case you haven't noticed. When we're excited or distressed, we usually do most of the talking. We'll say, oh, I want to go to someone because I just need to talk. We'll maybe text someone at first and say, hey, are you free right now? I just really need to talk, or I'd like to talk to you. But what we really mean is, I just need someone to listen while I do 99% of the talking. When we're really upset or excited, even if we're not talkers normally, when there's just a lot of emotion in there, normally we do most of the talking. So we say that we want to talk with someone, but really we just want to talk to them. We want to do most of the talking, don't we? There are many people that we go to when we need someone to talk to. It could be a friend, a family member, or maybe if you don't feel like there's anyone you can go to in your family because they're too close to the issue, you'll go to a friend, sometimes even a coworker. I think we all know what it's like to have a coworker who Sometimes shares a little bit too much. You know, they're just talking at the water cooler or at break time, and you're like, wow, this person is really sharing a lot of sensitive information with us. They might even be oversharing. So when you really need to talk to someone, there's no telling who you'll go to. Sometimes we overshare our feelings with a person and then realize later that that person was not actually trustworthy or maybe did not really care about us. We were so desperate to go to someone that we were almost willing to go to anyone, and then that had consequences later on that we didn't anticipate. But there's someone that we can trust who really does care. Someone who is not going to take our words out of context. Someone who knew what we were going to say before we even opened our mouths. And he is always listening. In fact, he's the best listener in the universe. You already know who it is I'm talking about. The Bible tells us what he's like. And that's why we're going to start today in one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's Matthew chapter 7, which for those of you who know the book of Matthew, you will recognize as the last chapter in what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, if, if I had to pick three chapters of the Bible that I could only read for a, that I, that I had to read for a year, I could only read like one passage of Scripture for an entire year, maybe even longer than that, it would be the Sermon on the Mount. 
In fact, that's exactly what Jared and I are doing with the youth group right now. We sat down and said, you know, even though we have fun at youth group, we play games and stuff like that, we also want to have some good discussion. What are we going to talk about? We realized, wow, these three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, have enough material that if we just do a few verses a week, we could actually talk about this for a whole year and not run out of things to talk about. Harry Truman, the 33rd president of the United States, once said, I do not believe there is a problem in this country or the world today which could not be settled if approached through the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. That was Harry Truman who said that back in 1945. It was true when he said it back then, and it is still true today. There is not a single problem in this country or this world that cannot be settled without the Sermon on the Mount. It would solve everything if we just go to these three chapters. And we won't have time to read as much of it as I would like to, but I do encourage you to read them when you get home. Listen to them on an audiobook. There are so many great ways to listen nowadays, on Bible apps or even on YouTube. Just go on YouTube, look up Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You can listen to it. I really encourage you to do that. But we're reading today from chapter 7. And in verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, kind of shocking, right? Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So let's break down these verses. First of all, verses 7 and 8. Now, notice that it says, if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be opened. It doesn't say, if you ask, you will receive exactly what you asked for. That's what we hope, but that's not what it says. It just says, ask, and it will be given to you. It doesn't say exactly what. We will receive, but it's not always going to be what we ask for. Often God will give us something better. If we always got exactly what we asked for, that wouldn't always be a good thing. Remember how I just said that sometimes oversharing with someone seemed like a good idea at the time, but then later on we realized it wasn't? Well, what if we asked for something that seemed like a good idea at the time, and God answered everything we asked for literally, and then later on we realized that was not such a good thing to ask for? God is thinking much further ahead than we are. When we ask from God, though, we will receive. I've said before, and I did not come up with this, that when we ask God for something, his answers to prayer are yes, not yet, or I have something better. It is never exactly no. God is not like a parent who just says, no, you're not getting anything. It's like, I'm not going to give it you asked for, or I'm not going to give it to you yet, but if that's not the case, I'm going to give you something better. It says that every good and perfect gift is from God. It says that in those next verses, if you, though you are evil, he's got, Jesus is saying that even though we try to be good parents, I don't think there's anyone who says, it is my goal to be the worst parent in the world, and I'm going to make sure that I, I fulfill that goal. I don't think anyone says that, at least no one I've met. I think everyone tries to be a good parent, tries to have good intentions, but we mess up along the way. We're human. We're going to mess up at everything we do. And that's because inside of us, our default nature is evil. We need help. We need forgiveness. So Jesus says, though your, your default, you're better at being evil than you are at being good, even you know how to give good gifts to your children. And if your child asked for food, you wouldn't give him something he couldn't eat. So if he, even you understand that as a human, how much more does a perfect holy God know how to give good gifts to those who love him? to his children. So basically, if we can do it well, God can do it better. In other words, God can do it best. So if we ask, we will receive. God is not going to ignore us. That's the point. 
And then whatever God gives will be good because he is good. That is really the point of verses 9 to 11, that uh, your Father in heaven will give good gifts to those who ask him. And then it almost seems sort of random that he says, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. It's kind of weird that he puts that in. But I, I think it's related because what he's saying is, like, if you know the right thing to do with your children, like, if you know what someone would uh, want you to do to them, then you should do that thing. Like, if you wouldn't want to get bread or a stone, uh, don't give that to your children. You know, you know that this is the right way to parent. So since you already know what you would or would not want someone to do to you, God is going to do what you would want him to do. Now go and do likewise, basically. Follow God's example. And I love how he says this sums up the law and the prophets. Which means that this one statement, do to others as you would have them do to you, sums up a large part of the Bible. So if you're ever wondering, you know, what's God like? What's important to him? What does he value? Go to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount not only tells us what we should do, but it tells us who God is. Again, not just how we should live, but who God is as a person, what's important to him. So now that we know that God, what God is like, now that we see the proof in Scripture that he is someone who wants to give us good things and wants to listen to us and, and wants to help us find and wants to open the door to us, why would we not go to him first? So often we go to other people and the results are disastrous. It doesn't end very well. So if you do have a problem where you sort of feel like you go to other people before God, here's another question. How well has that been working out for you? Has it helped in situations where you need to solve a problem? Has it made you less anxious? Has it made you more peaceful? Is going to other people first really working that well for you right now? And if you feel like maybe it isn't, I want to suggest the alternative. And the alternative is the title of our message, which is Start With God. See, normally we don't start with God. If we're lucky, sometimes we end with him. After we try it on our own and mess up a bunch of things, then we decide that finally plan Z, not even like B, C, or D, like the final plan is, well, I guess maybe I should try prayer now because nothing else works. Usually prayer is the last thing we try when it should be the first thing we do. So when we start with God, that's starting off on the right foot. If we do not start off with God, we are starting off on the wrong foot. We are already off to a bad start. So you'll hear people say a lot, you know, go to God, spend time with God, have like your, your quiet time or your God time. And my generation especially of like young Christians, this was something that we were really urged to do heavily, but without a lot of guidance. We were just told, oh, oh go to God, spend your time with God and it'll work out. And we really weren't told how to do that. And this left a lot of us feeling disappointed like maybe we did it wrong or that God wasn't listening to us because we did spend time with God. You know, we read our devotional or we had our quiet time or whatever and we didn't feel any different. What happens when we walk away feeling like that? As crazy as this sounds, even though we feel like we started with God, I think in those moments where a time with God feels empty, I think we actually went to God, but we started with us. Hear me out here. I think sometimes you can go to God, but you can start with yourself. And that is where I think we mess up. I think sometimes what we call praying is just worrying out loud. It's just verbalizing our anxieties in such a way that it's like we are talking to a God with a lowercase g instead of an uppercase g. We are talking in such a way that our problems are bigger than God. And yes, they may be very big, but there's no way that they are bigger than him. And when we start by just talking about our problems, I think we get it messed up. And that actually messes up our time with God and puts a bad taste in our mouth where we feel like we didn't get anything out of it, and then we are less inclined to do that again. So how do we start with God when we spend time with him? Well, I think there are two big words that start with the letter W that we see in Scripture. One is worship, and the other is the word. Worship and word. I think if we start with those in our time with God, it's going to go a lot better. So first of all, worshiping his name. Psalm 100 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. 
Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. Basically, start with that. Let that be the thing you lead with. Do that first and everything else after. And I notice personally, when I go to spend time with God, sometimes I just can't find the words. It's hard to know what to say. And often I do this when I'm in my car. You ever try to like pray in your car? Sometimes it's just a mess. It's always easier to do when I start with worship. I'm not even a singer or a musician. My brother is the musical one in the family. But when no one else is around, that's when I prefer to sing. You know, I just sing out loud to God. And now it's easier to connect with him, it feels like. So what if we started with worship? So let, let me model two things here. What if a conversation with God started with, hey, God, listen, I just need to talk to you. The, the bills are so tight this month. Uh, I don't know uh, how I'm going to get through this. I'm so stressed out. There's not enough time in the day. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I, I'm just so stressed out. And, you know, I know someone who's sick, and I need you to help them. And, and I, I just, Lord, please, we could do that, or we could do this. And you can join me if you know it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. See how the atmosphere just changed when we did that? Wasn't that nice? And the atmosphere changed in the same way when we were worshiping before. But notice how that faded. We sort of like lost that. And we might have already started thinking about our problems again, or what we have to do later today. So what happened? Did like the presence of God fade? Did God leave? No, God doesn't change. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. What changed? We did. We stopped focusing on him. We started focusing on us. Praise takes the focus off of us and puts it back on him. That is the power of praise. You can worry or you can worship. You can panic or you can praise. All of our problems happen when we are thinking about us and obsessing on and focusing on us. When we take the focus off of us and put it on him, that is what it looks like to start with God. That's doing it the right way. So you might come into your time with God with all these worries and all these words and, and all these concerns. Start with praise. I guarantee you're going to have fewer of those by the time you are done. So that's number one. Start with worship. If you're starting with God, how do you do that? Worship first. Enter his thanks with thanks. His, his gates with thanksgiving. And then the second one, word, God's word. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. In other words, the written word of God shows us where to go. Starting with the word and with worship is a lot better than what we normally do, which is just verbalizing our anxieties and worrying about what to do. Even though we go to God, we still start with us. We start with worry instead of worship and with our words instead of his word. And we should not get caught up in our own words. We really should go to scripture. I mean, I think sometimes even before we pray, because scripture helps us understand how to pray. Once again, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have been reading from chapter 7. In chapter 6, Jesus says, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father already knows what you need before you ask him. He says, this then is how you should pray. And then he gives us the prayer that we will pray later in this service. He says, you don't even need that many words. It's not like it's going to increase your chances of being heard. He already hears you. He already knows what you're going to say before you even start speaking. So we don't even need that many words to begin with. And also, listening to God's word in his scripture in the Bible prevents us from putting words in his mouth. I know a lot of people who have had very negative experiences in their time with God because they believe God spoke to them, 
They believed like God was giving them a sign or a word or a confirmation. And then as time went on, they realized that what they thought was going to happen didn't happen. God does not lie. So if you think you heard God say something and it doesn't happen, one of two things can be the case. Either you don't understand it yet, you know, it's one of those things where God says not yet, and you will get the answer, or it wasn't God speaking. It was your imagination. You got caught up in your own feelings and thought it was God, but it actually wasn't. God does still speak. The Holy Spirit does speak to us and impress on our hearts and show us visions, but it is never going to contradict what is in here. So if you feel that God is telling you to do anything that contradicts Scripture, whatever is speaking is not God. And because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you do to others as you would have them do to you, this sums up a large part of the Bible. Anything that contradicts that, anything that God has told you that is not instructing you to do to others the way you would have them do to you, is not God speaking. And, you know, sometimes I think when we get so obsessed with hearing the voice of God instead of focusing on, on worship and on his word, we get obsessed with hearing something. Oh, I want to hear something. I want to receive something. I want to receive a word from the Lord. I think when we get really obsessed with that, I think deep down we're kind of hoping that God is going to tell us something other than what's in his word. Basically, he's going to tell us something that gets us out of having to do what it says in his word. I remember when I was in high school, I, uh, uh, I would like pray occasionally about a crush that I had or someone I liked that the relationship would work out. I was like, oh God, show me if this is the one. You know, show me if this person is the person I should be with. And I was ignoring what he already told me to do, which is treat other people the way you want to be treated. If someone had a really big crush on you, right, and, uh, and you didn't know it, how would you want them to handle that? Well, you probably wouldn't want them to fantasize about you in their head and make up all these wild stories and imaginations about how you're perfect for them and you guys are meant to be together and do all this without even talking to you. <laughs> Speaking from experience here. So, if we already know that we wouldn't want someone to do that to us, why are we doing that to someone else and asking God if they're the one? It's because we're ignoring what he's already said. God has already spoken. He hasn't necessarily told us if that person is the one, but guess what? We don't need to know that. All we need to, do, need, need to know is what we should do next. And that is why I think sometimes when we're obsessed with getting a word from the Lord, it's because we want to ignore praising him, we want to ignore how great he is, and we want to ignore what he has already said, which is probably some form of you already know what to do. God guides, but he has already spoken. And in the words of Harry Truman, there is not a single problem that could not be solved by listening to the Sermon on the Mount. Whatever it is you're praying about that you're obsessed with getting an answer for from God, I guarantee you some form of that answer is already in one of these three chapters. If not, it is already in the Bible. So probably one of the best pieces of advice that I can give when talking to God is do not look for results. You want to write anything down, please write that down. When you're spending time with God, do not look for results. So what should you look for? Look for him. Look for Jesus. Look for how great he is. Look to be more like him. That's what you should look for. Because when we look for results, we get caught up in, oh, I don't feel any different. Uh, you know, I'm not doing that again. It's like we can use that argument for many things. Oh, I don't feel any better, so... It, I'm not doing it again. You could, we could use that argument for like eating healthy or going to the gym. Things that we know are good for us. Scientifically, we know that getting on a, trid, on a treadmill and increasing circulation and, and working out and burning calories is good for us. But if we're like, oh, I feel tired, I don't feel any different, that's ignoring what we know to be true in science and instead following our feelings instead of what we know. You cannot just focus on whether or not you felt any different we have to take God at his word that spending time with him does make a difference. That's faith. Faith is following what we know to be true and not being led astray by our feelings instead. So when we spend time with God, do not look for results. Do not be obsessed with getting an answer or something like that. Just talk to him. Uh, Amanda and I, my wife, we have a worship album we've been listening to a lot lately. And 
the first song in the album is Your Great Name. You might have heard the song before. It goes, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name. And it goes on to say, Redeemer, my healer, Lord Almighty, my Savior, Defender, you are my King. When I enter my time with God just saying that, it takes my attention off of my problems, and now I am focusing on Him instead. So when we start with the Word and we start with worship, our time with God is going to be a lot more meaningful. It is much better than going to other people. My father-in-law has a, a quote that I love. He says, a lot of people pick up the phone when they should be going to the throne. <laughs> you pick up the phone and you call someone when you should be going to the throne of God. And what's the right way to go to the throne? You don't start with you. You start with worship and you start with his word. That's actually going to him. You go to God and you know what? He wants us to do that. When I was in high school and even college, I had this real problem where I would go to other people before I would go to God. If I was upset about something or excited about something, I would call up my friends in North Carolina. I would call up my friend in West Babylon. I would call my friends, call my friends. And you know what? I was a bad friend because I would do 90% of the talking, if not more. I wouldn't ask them how they were doing. It was clear that I did not call uh, really for them. I called for me. And it was selfish. And my friend Kyle, who was so patient with me during this time, he called me one day and he said, listen, I was praying and I really feel like the Lord put something on my heart that he wanted me to share with you. He said, do you know where in scripture it says that God is a jealous God? And he said, it's, it's in the second commandment where God says, you shall not make any idols or bow down to them in worship for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. And at first, that sounds like, ooh, you know, is, is God like, you know, insecure or something? No, he's not insecure. He just knows he has the right to receive our worship. He created us. What if your kid started obsessing with someone else's parents? How would you feel? You'd be like, you little ingrate. I pay your taxes. You don't even know what those are yet. I feed you. I clothe you. I do your laundry. I'm even a good parent to you. And you're worshiping someone else's parent? That's what it means to be a jealous God. None of you give God a hard time. That's how he feels if your kids were worshiping someone else. He has the right to receive our worship and receive our attention. So he has every right to be jealous. And he said, my friend Kyle said, Michael, God is jealous for your attention. He wants you to go to him first. He wants you to start with him. And that convicted me. I felt that. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I've been doing God and everyone around me a real disservice. What is the order that the two greatest commandments are in? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have to do those things in order. Love God first. Then you know what love is like. Because the second one is like it. Then you can go and do likewise to other people. Even those two greatest commandments that we say every other week start with God, emphasizing how vitally important it is that we do that. So I learned that I had to stop going to the phone picking up the phone, and I had to go to the throne instead. And now when I'm excited about something, when I'm upset or distressed about something, I start with God. What do I do? I get in my car, and for those of you who can't drive yet, you can find alternatives, but I think the car is a great place as long as you're still focusing on driving. I just turn on the music, and I praise first, and then I might remember what I know about God and his word. Then I will start talking with him about my problems or my requests. And you know what you'll notice if you do it that way? you'll have a lot less to say at the end. If you start with praise, with worship, and then with God's word, you will realize that all those things you planned on saying at the start, all those problems that seemed big, seem a lot smaller and a lot simpler and a lot clearer. And you will have a lot less to ask or say if you start with those things first. I think that's part of the proof that we're doing it right. And going to God teaches us what love is like. It helps us enhance the rest of our relationships. I'll end with this. Because often what we call love is just using another person. It's needing another person. Sometimes we can't tell the difference. You ever heard someone say, you know, I love you just so much. I need you. I don't know how I'd live without you. That might be true. But can you be sure you would love that person if you didn't still need them? This is something that we get a little messed up on. Think about it. Imagine a man has a, a very loving wife who meets all of his needs, who cooks for him, who, like, uh, does his laundry, and hopefully he still pulls his weight. But this woman is incredible and, and does a lot of great things for him. I may be speaking from experience here. 
Imagine, though, that wife became physically disabled and was not able to do any of those things anymore, was not able to cook or clean or drive or any of those things. Imagine she could no longer meet his needs. Here's the question. Would he still love her? That's how you can find out whether or not you really love someone. If you love them and are willing to do things for them, even if they cannot do anything for you. Can you love someone if you need them? You can, but it's hard to be sure sometimes. Here's the amazing thing about God. While other people might just love us or appear to love us because they need us, because they get things from us, God doesn't need us. Isn't that crazy? He didn't create us because he was lonely. The Trinity was in communion with himself. In Genesis, it says, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. God had company. He didn't make us because he needed us. He didn't save us for that reason either. He saved us because he wanted to. Not because he had to, but because he wanted us. And that, I think, is the true proof that God is the person we should start with because we can know that he loves us with no strings attached. In spite of not needing us, he loves us anyway. And that is the proof that he really loves us. So remember, you cannot form a true connection with someone if you're just talking about yourself the whole time. You wouldn't want to have a relationship with someone who just talked about themselves the whole time. God is willing to listen to us no matter what we say, but that relationship is going to be a lot more wholesome if instead of starting with us, we start with him. Starting with God changes everything. It will change your family life. It will change your relationship with your friends. It will change your work environment. It will change the way you are at school. It will change the way you are everywhere if you start with God before starting with yourself or with other people. And when we do that, we will find that everything falls into place. So Lord, help us start our day with you now. And start by praising you and remembering what you've said in your word. By going to you with thanksgiving, with worship and not with worry. And by focusing on your words instead of ours. You said that heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will never fade. And those are the words that I cling to, that we cling to. Thank you for loving me and listening to me, even when I started with myself even when I didn't give you the praise that was due you and the gratitude that is due you for every good and perfect thing that you have given me. Yes, I have needs. All of us here have needs, but you have blessed us so much already and you are going to continue to give us good things because that's just who you are. And thank you for promising uh, promising us that you will never change and that your love will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Lord, for loving us even though you don't need us and for showing us what it means to start with you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.